Well, good morning. Thanks for joining us here this morning. Uh, and uh, I will just go jump right into it because we have a very meaty topic, I think, and many things to cover over this next hour. Uh, but first, just to introduce our panel, we have Secretary Alan Estevez, U.S. Undersecretary of Commerce for Industry and Security, uh, Admiral Michael Gilday, Chief of Naval Operations, uh, Secretary William LaPlante, U.S. Undersecretary of Defense for <coughs> Acquisition and Sustainment, James Takelet, Chairman, President, CEO of Lockheed Martin, and Senator Roger Wicker of Mississippi. Welcome to you all. And I think we'll start here with maybe just a few opening remarks from each of our panelists on this topic of a robust and resilient industrial base, and then we'll go from there. So, uh, Secretary Estevez, let's start with you. Sure. Thank you. Oops. See whether we get that better? Much better. Uh, a couple of points. You know, my, my job at Commerce is on the export control side, which we call the defense side. So, you know, I just put on these export controls regarding China that will slow China's ability to produce the highest end semiconductors for a period of time. They will figure this out. Uh, but what we've done is pretty comprehensive and it will slow them down, which is important for our national defense. That is insufficient for what needs to be done. We need to play offense too. So Senator Wicker, CHIPS Act, uh, key in invigorating our sector there. That's one sector. There's other sectors where we need to invest. We need American industry, Jim, uh, to play its role in innovating and developing the new technologies that we need to protect ourselves. And we need to develop the talent in America to do that. So we stop there and we'll go down and we can talk about those things as we go through. That sounds great. Admiral Gilday. Yeah, just a couple of comments leading off. Uh, first of all, with respect to uh, coming out of coming out of COVID, um, I think that the degree of opaqueness that exists between the Pentagon down 395 and uh, Crystal City is somewhat, uh, is somewhat lifted. I think I see a much stronger relationship, a much more uh, honest relationship with industry, specifically uh, supply chain vulnerabilities. Those discussions are very, very healthy. We both have a lot at stake there on both sides. And so I see that, I uh, wouldn't necessarily uh, refer to it as teamwork, but I think I think honest, uh, uh, honest uh, conversations about those kinds of uh, challenges that we face. Um, the second thing that I'd, I'd mention just briefly is, as I look across this audience is that the, uh, when people typically think about the defense industrial base, they really think about the primes, they think about the shipbuilders, they think about at the right end of the continuum, those big companies. Um, haven't spent the last couple of days at, uh, uh, here at, at, at just north in Silicon Valley and uh, right now in the Middle East, we have a big um, unmanned exercise going on called Digital Horizons. I think of all of the opportunity exists at the other end of the spectrum uh, with uh, small high-tech companies that build unmanned platforms that specialize in AI and data analytics. We are really leveraging that kind of innovative technology. And I think at the same time, uh, I think that that is having a very positive productive impact on the other end of the continuum, uh, those large companies. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, I guess I'd start with a few remarks uh, citing the national defense strategies recently released and how it ties to this topic of integrated deterrence, campaigning, partners and allies. Really underneath that all is a robust industrial base and a resilient industrial base and really a 21st industrial base that gets at a little bit what the CNO was getting at. We need all hands on deck. We need everybody from uh, the, the companies like Jim's to the right to small startups that don't even know how to spell DOD. We need everybody. But we also need everybody not, to, not just to work on the front end or the back end, but to working on the design and development and the production together going back and forth. That's where we need the innovation. I think that, you know, that's where, that where my head is at. So I think that we have a great opportunity now because we're being focused by the events of Ukraine and looking around the world. And I think there's a real technology opportunity to take modern design techniques, some call it digital engineering with high powered computing, and going back and forth with advanced manufacturing, including with small companies and startups and getting into uh, really economies of scale and really not just to follow the industrial model of ser in series, but to do it all together. Okay. 
I have a, I have a feeling you, Jim, have a few thoughts on that. Yeah. Good morning, Morgan. <laughs> Uh, good morning to everybody here. Uh, look, it's evident to everybody that we're in a geopolitical competition era, but it's great for me to hear our government leadership uh, recognize that we're also in a techno security competition, especially with China, but with others as well. And in the case of China, their leadership has identified that digital technology is at least as important as physical or Newtonian technologies to the future of defense. And with civil military fusion in their system, they're including their digital industries in their defense enterprise more and more effectively. Therefore, I think it's really critical and timely that the relationship between the US government industry that the CNO rec uh, rec recognized just a minute ago really get driven home. And it's got to evolve rapidly for us to be able to compete with China and others. And the strategy integrated deterrence that, that you mentioned, Mr. Secretary, really demands the implementation of join all domain operations. And to actually do that, uh, we have to address our acquisition process because the existing processes and organizations in acquisition in DOD are designed to address physical development technology cycles. Those run up to 10 years and some of them beyond because of the complexity of satellites, submarines, aircraft, et cetera. These processes and procedures are unsuited though for the more rapid development cycles in the digital world that you referred to, Bill, which could be 10 weeks or 10 months, but they're not 10 years. So to maintain our techno security industrial lead, which we have today uh, against China, I think it's imperative for DOD to establish a parallel acquisition process to acquire those 21st century digital technologies that you talked about, Bill, that you need to deploy JADO. And that's really the theme that, that we're driving is how do we get the small, medium, and large, especially the large, including them, digital leaders in the US economy involved in the, in the defense enterprise? Senator Wicker. Thank you. I think this is a good follow-up to our breakfast panel. And I'm sure it was designed that way. I can't resist uh, making general comments that, uh, of course, pertain to our industrial base. Um, uh, Chairman Smith, um, is, um, he's been a, a, a great friend and, and an ally in adding $45 billion to the defense budget. Um, but he did say a couple of things that, um, that I, I want to respond to about the think tanks who come to us and say that uh, everything is, uh, is going to hell and, and uh, scaring us to death. Um, I would love to hear a think tank come and tell us that they war-gamed the Pacific and, um, and we're just fine, uh, that they, they war-gamed um, a competition with um, uh, the People's Republic of China over Taiwan and we were great. But I, I haven't heard that from the classified war games in the Pentagon, which we, we hear uh, about in an open forum. Uh, we don't hear the classified parts of it in, in a forum like this. But we, we know that we lose war games um, when, we, when we fight uh, China. We know that the RAND Corporation says that we are not ready um, for, for whatever might happen, and I don't know if there's a Davidson window or not, but uh, it, it could certainly come uh, sooner than that. Heritage Foundation, which is an organization, it's another think tank, and it's an organization that I respect, does an annual index of, index of military strength. And the one that comes out for 2023 just came out last month. Um, the Army, the U.S. Army was rated as marginal. The U.S. Navy was listed as weak by the Heritage Foundation. The Air Force was listed as very weak. The Marine Corps listed as strong, but it is small. Space Force weak. And, um, and Heritage says there's a growing risk of not being able to defend national interest. So, I'm, I'm making general comments, and I'll be happy to drill down uh, on the more specific subject matter. But, but I would just say to you that our industrial base, whether it be the large corporations like Huntington Ingalls with 
uh, 11,500 employees in the state of Mississippi, or uh, um, the, the smaller suppliers with 90 or fewer, um, um, like Seaman Composite that makes the nose cones for submarines and we absolutely could not do without them. Uh, it, it's all, it all goes back to the fact that for whatever reason, um, over, over time, we have, not, um, we have not funded the military and we, we have not made sure that we were ready to do the two things that we, that we might be called on to do. And that is uh, when in two major theater areas. So uh, I worry about the fact that we're not um, supporting the industrial base to the extent that we're not giving them the programs they need to manufacture the ships and weapons and ammunition we need. And I, I would imagine it's not just a matter of funding, but it's also a matter of things like continuing resolutions and the roles those play, especially on your mid-tier and your smaller uh, suppliers within the supply chain. I want to get into all of this a lot more. Okay, but first, I'd be glad uh, to talk about the continued <laughs> but, resolution. But first, uh, but first, Admiral Gilday, I, I want to get your response to that. Um, to the, if you to were to, to what the senator just said, um, if. We talk, I mean, on CNBC, this is a conversation that comes up all the time. Investors are very focused on this topic because uh, they see it as a potential black swan. But if and when China were to make a move on Taiwan, is the U.S. Navy, if tasked to do so, in a position to counter it so successfully? About a third of the Navy's at sea today. Uh, we're forward. We have more ships right now in the European theater than the rest of the NATO nations combined. We have more than 25 ships. We have ships right now in the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea. We are forward, we are present in the Arabian Gulf, in the Gulf of Aden, in the Mediterranean Sea. The United States Navy is in contact with peer competitors under the sea, on the sea, and in the air every single day. You see snippets of it with ships going through the Taiwan Strait, they're going nose to nose with with, uh, with Chinese ships. You see it with our aircraft in the Eastern Mediterranean or up by the Sea of Japan with the Russians. There's a lot of stuff going on under, under the sea that I can't talk about publicly, uh, but just to know that we have significant overmatch in that domain against any competitor. In terms of looking at our investments, right now on the Hill uh, is the largest shipbuilding budget in the history of the United States Navy at 27 and a half billion. You cannot throw much more money at the seven shipbuilders that build U.S. warships in the United States of America right now. Their capacity is about at max. And Congress is helping us max them out. I would say the same thing for weapons production. If you take a look at our budgets and where we're putting money, we're trying to send a very strong signal to industry that we need consistent, stable production lines for weapons with range and speed for a long time. We certify every deploying unit for combat operations before we take in all lines and send them to sea. There are an awful lot of assertions in different surveys. Um, those surveys don't go out. Uh, take a look at who the audience is for those surveys. And I would uh, invite all of you to talk to sailors, to Marines, to airmen, to Coast Guardsmen. Uh, to soldiers, uh, to space guardians, and get their sense of whether or not they feel that they're ready and what, what they think that we're not doing more of that we should be. I think that would be a good data point. But uh, look, you know, the Secretary of the Navy has been clear to me that our responsibility is to field the most lethal, capable, ready force, not in 2027, but on December 3rd, 2022. And that's what we focus on every day. Okay. Secretary LaPlante, you dig into the supply chain. Uh, you see, are assessing things like production and the ability to ramp production. Um, it's been in focus with Ukraine, certainly. We can talk about it where that's concerned. We can talk about it where China, uh, countering China is concerned as well. What do you see as challenges right now when it comes to the industrial base? And we'll use the example of Ukraine uh, to start. How quickly what needs to happen to see some of these lines ramp more quickly and some of these systems be able to get into the hands of Ukrainians or allies or even into replenishment of our stockpiles more quickly? Yeah, thank you. And uh, 
I think just to start with the experience we all had during COVID, is we all, I think a lot of Americans we, and people around the world recognize whether it's baby formula or prescription drugs or PPV, PPE or getting a vaccine quickly, that it didn't take much to disrupt our, our, our supply chain just in our economies. Why is that? Probably because of the just-in-time delivery, minimizing inventory, reduced tooth to tail, all the rest of it. We have, this, we have the same issue in the DOD, and you, you find out in a time of crisis. So that, that's point one. Point two is, and particularly in the DOD, we've gone out of our way to really minimize any redundancies, because again, that's efficiency. Well, one person's re, uh, efficiency is another person's vulnerability. So what we've done systemically, just uh, it started well before Ukraine, is going through, we have a, a, a team of experts doing this, of deep dives into critical munitions and systems, and going down and finding the choke point in each one. And then, the, and the choke point can be a variety of things. It can be the workforce, it could be ball bearings, it could be batteries, it could be obsolescent parts, it could be microelectronics. And then as best we can, get money to those places using uh, Defense Production Act, et cetera. At the same time we're doing that, we are also building the plans to get into more sustainable, longer-term production lines. And the other piece of it I would say to folks is that we have to get comfortable with the fact that production and getting to production is as important as part of any other part of the acquisition system. And I would really want our folks that are innovators in the front end, which we need you, we will not win without you, to also help us on the back end as well. I think that's what we need to do as a country. Jim, I see you nodding your head. Well, first of all, I, I want to recognize Dr. LaPlante, the Army, and the other services for really you know, attacking this issue when it emerged. Uh, but it's a little bit at the battlefield hospital level, and you guys are fighting hard, and you're making great progress. But as you said, the U.S. defense industrial base is scoped for maximum efficiency at peacetime production rates. That's what it's built to do today. Uh, we're working on that now with government, but it's overly vulnerable to those disruptive events like COVID as a result, and there's labor and supply shortages that are still continuing through. Uh, because we've been structured in such this, in, in this way. It was also rapidly, un, or unable to rapidly scale and scale up quickly when the circumstances demanded it, like with Ukraine. So we're learning a lot now about the situation between the supply chain disruption of COVID and the Ukrainian crisis. So we should be applying concepts of anti-fragility to the whole industrial base. And by anti-fragility, I mean, when, when there are shocks to the system, they do not damage or stop the system from operating. And some of the tools that I know that you're already employing in the DOD, multi-year procurement contracts for expendables, such as munitions, but you need to go beyond that. A significant reduction in the single source suppliers of key components, because you won't have those emergencies in the ball bearing single supplier for that one part that you need. Uh, and then thirdly, you know, procurement and maintenance of the tooling and capacity you need to quickly move two standard deviations above what peacetime production rates are in a reasonable amount of, in short time. So those are some of the ideas that we can implement, and I know that the government's looking at now, but we're gonna need to fund those. You know, resiliency isn't without cost. There'll be some cost to this, but we're learning so much in this experience that I think it's gonna be a cost-benefit trade-off worth looking really hard at. Okay. I, I know there's a few people who want to <laughs> jump in on this. <laughs> uh, Secretary Estevez, I'll start with you. Sure, sure, a couple of things. One, and I, and I like what you were saying, Jim, but you know, and we need to look at this as across the full American industrial base, not just the defense industrial base, because frankly, they're completely linked, right? We need to get away from reliance on adversarial countries as sources of supply. Again, the China problem, mm -hmm. which, you know, rare earth, neo dominium magnets, and on and on and on. I could go on and on and on there. And we need to start encouraging buy America or buy allied. And if it costs a little more, okay, we need to encourage. And companies need to understand their supply chains, and they need to start thinking about how to diversify those supply chains. Right? If COVID didn't show that, Ukraine should have in spades. You know, if, if Putin is doing anything good, he's, he's helping NATO membership. And he's helping people understand the problems in their supply chain, including our European allies who are all over this right now. Two, we need to look at our own manufacturing capability, Bill, to your point. It's not just 
R&D, it's got to be production, and modernizing our production capability. That includes the organic production at DOD, but production across industry to digital and industrial capability, 21st century capability, more agile, more fluid. You know, we're not going to be building F-35s at Willow Run, right? So we need to figure out a better way to increase our production capacity in the United States. Admiral Gilde. I just make a, a couple of comments uh, as a guy in uniform uh, and thinking about this uh, through the lens of what could we possibly do uh, to allow industry to be able to surge when it needs a surge. And I go back to steady state production. You got to solve that problem first and we haven't. And so I believe that from the services and uh, from the services, we need to give a steady, clear, consistent um, and predictable demand signal to industry. That needs to be reflected in our budgets. The sine waves uh, are unhelpful. We've seen that in munitions lines out of Ukraine. What that ends up yielding, I, I believe, is more level-loaded production lines that are much more efficient. And the next thing I'd add is uh, for the services, we also have to minimize changes to that production line when it's in progress. That leads to more time, it leads to more cost, and typically takes us off track. So I just add those uh, uh, tidbits to uh, the comments that Mr. Takelet made and uh, the Secretary made. Senator Wicker, uh, I want to get your thoughts on that, both in terms of budget and also in terms of the crafting of policy, the balancing of existing programs uh, and a production ramp uh, and what that means in terms of lo balancing legacy, legacy where it makes sense versus newer technologies and investing in newer capabilities and how quickly we can we can well, make I, that I think we, ha we have to um, we have to balance that based on the the best information we have um, and um, again a lot of what was said at breakfast is absolutely true but we're still going to need tanks and we're still going to need. Um, um, missiles and we're still going to need ammunition. Uh, let me also clear, uh, let me make sure everyone's clear. I'm on Admiral Gilday's side. Um, he's been given a job to do and he has to put the best face on, on uh, what he's been provided. Uh, and Secretary Del Toro is here too. Uh, and I think he's the only uh, secretary that uh, actually spent a year in Pascagoula making ships. So um, I, I'm on their side. Um, a few years ago, when we passed the first Ships Act, maybe we'll pass another one soon, um, every uh, expert in uniform, admirals and generals around the globe, told us we needed 355 ships to compete. Um, we finally decided to take them at their word, and we didn't pass a sense of the Senate. We passed a statute that was passed by the House of Representatives and signed by the President saying that 355 ships in our Navy is the statutory requirement. Um, it's, it's been somewhat treated as advisory since then. But, but the Congress in that statute, and, and what I would have preferred to do is actually implement that um, in our authorization bills. China has 400 ships, and they're building them more, and they're building them better. Some of ours are, are much more technically capable. But I, I just, I want to give Secretary Del Toro and, and Admiral Gilday uh, what the experts say they've needed. Now, with regard to the budget, uh, I, I, was, I was heartened to hear everyone say that we need to pass an NDAA. Um, there had been some school of thought that, that uh, the new speaker um, would, would like to tinker with that after the first of the year. I, I really do, I think that we all, um, I think most of us agree, we need to get our work done for this year um, and, and, uh, and get that done. And of course we need to pass the NDAA really before uh, uh, before the end of the summer next year. Uh, with regard to the omnibus, it, it, in my view, it would be a disaster not to pass an omnibus before the end of this calendar year. Um, we had, 
I had my staff calculate this um, uh, just a few days ago. It, if we go on a continuing resolution, which is what we appropriated last year, we just do that again with a few anomalies, it is actually, Admiral, it is an $80 billion hit to national defense, not just $45 billion. So it, it would be an utter disaster and would send absolutely the wrong signals to Russia, send us uh, wrong signals to the people who are, uh, are, are um, our adversaries and looking at a possible challenge to us in the Pacific. Um, in addition, there's such a small majority uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, a small Republican majority coming next year. I, I really think it would be very, very difficult for Speaker McCarthy to, uh, to get an omnibus bill done after the first of the year. So it's incumbent on us. If we support national defense and if we back the public in, uh, in hoping that we can avoid a war in, uh, with China and, um, and, and help our Ukrainian friends win, we, we need to pass an omnibus bill. It's not the way to do it. One other thing. Um, uh, I don't think Americans realize there's one person in the world who can schedule a bill on the Senate floor. There's on, only one person on the face of the globe, and that's the majority leader. Um, I, I will say this for Mitch McConnell. We've had a hard time bringing bills to the floor, but we, under his leadership, when he was majority leader, we do, did do some mini buses and didn't leave everything to the end. But uh, clearly, for whatever reason, um, Majority Leader Schumer has decided not to allow the appropriation bills to come to the floor um, against, our, um, against our best advice. I, I hope we, he's going to be Majority Leader again next year. And I hope, um, in light of everything that's going on and the threats that might happen to us, um, we can come to a national consensus to go ahead and bring those bills and let the House and Senate work on them. But one person, and one person alone, schedules bills on the Senate floor, and that's the majority leader. Mm. Secretary LaPlante, um, the fact that we're even having this conversation, and we tend to have this conversation to some varying degree, unfortunately, rather regularly over the years, how do you navigate it, both in terms of continuing to fortify an industrial base from a DOD perspective, but also being able to bring on new technologies, yeah. new potential companies, create some sort of certainty uh, in those for the uh, ability to on-ramp some of these uh, new, uh, yeah, new technologies uh, in an uncertain environment? Yeah, it's a great question. And I would just say, let's first talk about the progress that's been made. It goes back multiple administrations. Uh, there is much, this is a good thing, there's much more prototyping going on and experimentation. There is much more of a leadership push, just like the, uh, the CNO being in Silicon Valley the other day. There's so much more of a leadership push to reach out to these non-traditionals, all that. So I think we're at a point where we've got to get this into the mainstream and we've got to get it to scale. And so this is where my head is and uh, as I've been watching this, and maybe it's overly influenced by Ukraine, is I think we can get these modern techniques uh, that are coming from the commercial world and the high-tech industry that are at this intersection of large data sets, AI, uh, modern digital engineering, where you're really able to go back and forth in designs, and you'll produce a design that a human would never have produced. You look at the thing and you say, my God, who produced it? But you find out it's optimal because the algorithm produced it. Getting that with production together out into the field is the next big step. So we got to get the, uh, the innovations and the new folks into the mainstream. Now, you can ask the question, we often do, how do you do that with major platforms, right? Well, there was an example just last night with the rollout of the B-21. B-21 has an open mission systems architecture deliberately put in with standard interfaces such that there can be technology insertion for the next 40, 50 years, and it could be competed with small businesses directly from the government to inject it right into the open architecture. That's what we need to do. And as when we have these open architectures, we've got to use them. And we've got to open them up to, to small businesses and to, and to startups and say, hey, do you want to get your algorithm into the B21? Here's a chance to, to do a bake-off. So those are the things we need to do. 
Secretary Estevez, I, I want to get your thoughts on that, especially because, I mean, a key part of this is that industrial capacity is, needs a market globally, and that's part of, I think, what helps to add resiliency, even in the face of maybe uncertain budgetary environments from uh, a government or a U.S. government perspective? So, so a couple of things, and I'm looking at it. Ellen Lord and Mike Brown are in the audience. And I was up in Silicon Valley with them the other day, look, also looking at technologies. I was also visiting some of the companies that I've impacted billions of dollars of their revenue by stopping them from being able to sell to China. Uh, so I thought it was important for me to go up and explain the national security implications of why we did what we did. But to Bill's point, you need to bring in the entire industrial base to have that innovative ecosystem. I mean, I was listening to some really cool stuff that I knew nothing about on technology, synthetic biology, for example, that you know, we need to start making investments in order to, to grow our own innovation ecosystem. My earlier comment, you know, if I impede China here, that's five years maybe, I need to run faster on the offensive side, so I'm making that five-year gap into a 10-year gap. And so that we as a nation, and we as a nation with our allies, can remain that far in front. Let me address the budget thing really fast, because since I'm in the Department of Commerce, people don't think about my budget as much. I know Senator Wicker does. Is, uh, I have these authorities to protect American companies and American people related to things like China cloud companies and China software connect, and I'm not going to go into the TikTok problem. But I have no money to do that because it's sitting on the floor of the Congress right now waiting. So I am doing this incredibly important job with borrowed manpower, trying to capture lawyers that are walking down 15th Street because they have a phone and they look like they might know something about this space. And that's not the way we should be doing business. We need to have budgets passed so that we can get on with our job. Uh, I want to pause here because <laughs> we have a live polling question. So for our audience, uh, I'm going to pull that up on, uh, on the screen here. It's, uh, the question is, many are concerned about how thoroughly integrated the American economy is with the Chinese economy. The US government should prioritize, number one, encouraging US businesses to move out of China, Two, adopting policies to support the U.S. industrial base to compete with China. Three, enacting sanctions on Chinese corporations threatening U.S. national security. Or four, leave it to China to decouple from the U.S. economy. Uh, so if you want to weigh in on this poll and, uh, and your thoughts, please do so now. We're going to continue the conversation. We'll come back to those results in just a few moments. Um, but Admiral Gilday, uh, I, I want to go back to you. I want to get your thoughts on how you're thinking about new technologies and new capabilities, especially given the fact that, and we're seeing this in industry, these investments in anticipation of it, the balancing of, I think, what the Navy currently looks like versus things like unmanned. Mm -hmm. So a lot of opportunities, uh, and some of this has been touched on up here over the last few minutes. Um, the fundamental problem is not attracting innovative, high-tech companies to DOD. That is not the problem. The problem is transitioning their products into a production line and crossing that three-year gap. When I think about, you know, there's an ongoing effort right now to, to uh, come up with ideas to revitalize a system that Secretary McNamara put in place in the 1960s. It doesn't quite work for the kinds of technologies that we want to leverage quickly in a decade of concern. What we want to be able to do is to get the production fast. And a couple of exemplars might be Operation Warp Speed, maybe how we fielded MRAPs quickly a decade or so ago. Those would be exemplars instead of blowing up the whole system. I just look, how do we do that really well? What do we learn from that? And how can we apply it to some of these new technologies? If I go back to the framework that McNamara created, there's a lot of laws, there's a lot of processes in place to drive down technical risk so that we don't scale too early and end up, end up, end up with stuff for hundreds of billions of dollars that doesn't work very well. There's plenty of examples of that. Now, if I, talk, if I think about the high-tech firms that are offering their products, their AI, uh, their AI products, their unmanned platforms, these are dual-use technologies, and much of that technical risk has already been driven down. It's already been driven down. And so we could go to the Congress. We can go to our, our, 
our boss, Secretary Del Toro, and he can take it up the chain of command of the Pentagon to say, look, I have a very high degree of confidence that this unmanned platform coupled with this AI software plug is going to solve the problem we need to solve, which is to understand the domain in which we operate in much better than we do today. I'm an optimist in terms of where we're headed. Again, I go back to you know, solving that problem, and I think that there are exemplars out there that we, so we should leverage, um, uh, learn from, and uh, uh, execute off of. We're starting to get some questions from the audience, and I want to weave them into this conversation. Uh, Jim, I'm going to put this question to you. What steps is the United States taking to strengthen our supply chain by de deconflicting it with potential adversaries? And I, I put that question to you because as we're having this conversation uh, about supply chain, uh, I would imagine that we're seeing a company like Lockheed Martin and many other companies I've spoken to uh, take a deeper, closer, more rigorous look at just how far down that supply chain goes and, and, and where different aspects of it actually come from. Sure. Well, there are regulations about where to source for uh, defense articles. And we you know, apply and you to those regulations. However, when you get three or four layers of suppliers down, they will be sourcing from distributors, small parts, microelectronics, uh, rare earth elements, magnets, as you mentioned, Alan. Uh, those come in pools. It's hard to figure out where that commercial distributor that sells to the fourth level down supplier got that magnet material. It's a real test case. I'll, I will point out to you. And we had to figure out that it happened. It took 15 years for someone to identify that that was going on. Wow. And then we were able to resolve it. But one way to resolve it is to go to Allen and get a waiver. Because either we don't know where that article ultimately comes from, as, as commercial and in, in, in defense industry, or it's the only place to get it, which is the real risk uh, for semiconductors, the CHIPS Act was really important to our industry, our company, and national defense. And so we advocated heavily with the administration for that because the semiconductors we need include the sub-10 or sub-6 nanometer chips. But most of them are much less sophisticated for, uh, than that. And almost all of that production is moving to three places, China, South Korea, and Taiwan. And the real issue of a nightmare scenario, not for the defense industrial base alone, but for the entire economy, is China to withhold its, its uh, you know, non sub-10 uh, nanometer chips for it to blockade Taiwan and intimidate South Korea in a way that none of them can export to the global economy anymore. It's the Russia play with natural gas. So we have to address microelectronics, semiconductors specifically, and not the most sophisticated, but all semiconductors. And then as I think, Alan, you had already mentioned, rare earth minerals and, and, and critical raw materials. Because if those get shut off by one or two countries that could be or are adversaries of ours, the div will stop, but the larger economy may also slow down or stop. So those are some of the critical areas there. Senator Wicker, how, how quickly and how effectively can the government step in to help uh, that process? I think we're going to uh, move, we are moving quickly and uh, uh, Commerce can, can verify this on implementing the, the Chips and Science Act. Um, we were talking uh, earlier about who gets credit for this and uh, uh, there are also some town meetings, uh, there's who gets blamed for this uh, because uh, there's some people who believe this is industrial policy and we ought to be using trade policy or some, uh, some other means that I don't think would be effective to get um, the, um, the, the semiconductors made in, in the United States. Uh, we're going to add a provision, I think, Monday. Or I think when, it, when uh, NDAA comes out Monday, we'll have a provision that perhaps some members of the panel are familiar with. There are three Chinese companies that we've, we very much want to prohibit uh, their chips from being in our products because of national security concerns. The, the problem um, with that that we've had to deal with is the, the layers of, of uh, supply, third and fourth um, level, it's hard to know 
uh, it's hard for the ultimate contractor to know uh, where those chips came from. And, and so we've had to work this out with a safe harbor clause, and I think we've got it where, we, uh, where it needs to be. Also, it will not be fully implemented for five years. But we are continuing as, as soon as Monday with the rollout of the NDAA of, of uh, again, trying to protect our national security from uh, China getting our secrets and at the same time not shutting down manufacturing because it's just impossible to comply with that. So Secretary thank you for Commerce for working with us on that. Uh, Secretary LaPlante, I, I actually want to get your thoughts on this discussion, especially when you talk about something like rare earths, just because right. it's coming up right now. It's a tricky one, right? Because we, we don't do very much in terms of mining here uh, where rare earths are concerned. So much of that does happen in China, and what doesn't happen in China gets sent to China for the refining process, almost all of it, actually. So hmm. when you think about the resilience uh, of the defense industrial base, and when you think about this kind of decoupling that's happening, and the fortifying and ensuring of companies like Lockheed Martin to be able to get those products they need, how do you, how do you navigate that? Yeah, I think, um, I think what we have to recognize is, is the term that some, some have used is called weaponized interdependence, which is the recognition by some countries that control of a certain part of the supply chain can actually be used, of course, for their national advantage, whether it's for chips or it's rare earths. I think in the case of rare earths, um, as has been said by many people, rare earths are actually not that rare. What is, what's the, the hard part about it is getting it, not just the material, but getting uh, the processing of it and extracting it. And it, there, it actually is a technology issue, and it's something that we in this country and with our friends, and this is another piece of what we're calling it friend shoring, have to start funding uh, new ways to extract the rare earths uh, wherever they come from. That is sort of what China locked up about 30 years ago. They recognized the fact that they could, they could lock into this market. Yes, China has a lot of stuff. They've dug a lot of holes in China. But that's not the key part. The key part is they locked up all the processing. We have to do that, too, and it's a high-tech issue. Um, the other piece of it, which I think is related to uh, supply chain, is thinking about buying uh, items as a service, where, where the, you know, we do space launch as a service. We have to ensure that they have the right supply chain in it, but then how they do the engineering, how they do um, the, the packaging, how they do the manufacturing is up to them. Um, but again, I think that's a tying between the supply chain and also how we buy things. Okay, we have so many questions coming in, which is very exciting. Um, so I'm gonna get to as many as I can here, but Admiral Gilday uh, mentioned, we've maximized the capacity of America's seven shipyards. Do we need an eighth or ninth shipyard? If America's shipbuilding capacity is maxed out, should the Navy be able to buy ships from trusted allies with shipbuilding capacity like, for example, South Korea? Yeah, I'm not going to touch the second one. And the first one, <laughs> uh, the answer is absolutely yes. So what we've seen in the mid-sized ships, that's where we have seen more competition. Austell down on the Gulf Coast, right? Shifting uh, shift their processes to, from aluminum to steel. Uh, much more competitive and, and with work coming their way uh, from the Coast Guard and they're doing some work for us on the Ford class carrier. Um, Fincantieri up, up in uh, Wisconsin is another mid-sized company that's come online here recently with Frigate. We need to incentivize the entry of additional companies into this, uh, in, into this uh, market, uh, make it more competitive, give us more capacity. Um, we've been fighting ground wars, obviously, for the last uh, 20 years. And so because that's been the priority, the nation has not made investment in the recapitalization of the United States Navy as high a priority as we probably should have. So now we're playing catch-up ball. So again, the Congress is being great at trying to, you know, um, at trying to optimize, maximize those production lines. But we need more shipbuilders, not just for the United States Navy in the United States Coast Guard, but also for the commercial industry. Uh, that is also a demand signal there. Um, we have significantly downsized the number of shipyards we have in the United States. Um, you know, over my lifetime, it's gone from uh, 60 uh, shipyards that uh, support a DOD uh, down, to, down to just seven. You could say the same thing for aerospace companies, over 50 down to maybe five space uh, launch companies, 
that build spacecraft cut in half from eight to four. Um, and so the trends are not good. It's, but, but, but it is a challenge, uh, I think, from a workforce perspective in a society where our manufacturing uh, demographic has uh, essentially been cut by uh, 35% over the past uh, three decades. And so it's not just the shipyards. It's also the ecosystem that supports them. It's vocational schools in terms of education. It's the Department of Commerce, the Department of Labor, the Department of Education kind of pitching in and shouldering this with us. It's wage incentives. Um, it is, um, uh, it's a number of things that I think we can think about in terms of revitalizing this critical part of the United States uh, economic sector. Senator Wicker. I, I was just thinking, tomorrow's headline, Gill Day refuses to rule out buying Navy ships from Korea. <laughs> I, I, uh, I actually um, a, a, agree with everything else he said. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Thanks, Senator. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's run through a few more questions. We have about six and a half minutes left here, so I'm going to do my best. Um, how can government better signal to corporations their needs from the industrial base? Who would like to take that? Well, let me, let me give a shot at it. I, I think we, and this, was, uh, this was mentioned earlier by the CNO, and we, hear, and we hear this term demand signal all the time. And what really is meant, as I understand it, is whether it's to a board of a corporation or a small business that's got investors, they have to see the business case. The business case has to close. Now, they know that they're not going to bat 1,000, but they want to bat something, some type of low batting average. And we got to give them the evidence, and it's got to be credible that they can do that. Part of it is these multi-year contracts. I think it's part of it. But the, the other piece of it, it gets to the production. And again, not to make everything about production, but if they can see the business case, that this, this item, this technology, this technique, this service can actually scale. And, and even if it can be spin off into the private sector and the public, and you can see a plausible business case, even if it's a one out of five chance, that's what they need to see. And we have to think of it that way and provide them that evidence. And if we can't provide the evidence to ourselves, then maybe we should think to ourselves, maybe we're not setting up the right conditions. So I think it's not just the focus on the technology, but the focus on the business case. And what closes the business case for corporations and for investors and small companies and startups? Jim? I, I really want to emphasize what Secretary LaPlante is speaking to here because all companies in a free market economy do have to have a return on investment, whether it's, the, as you say, the smallest startup all the way up to tech companies we're working with like Verizon and Intel and Microsoft. We're working with them because they think ultimately there's a business case there for them. But there are some other aspects of working with the Defense Department or the Federal Acquisition Regulation that really inhibit those business cases for everybody. You know, one is how do we balance the level of compliance and oversight with the cost of doing it? A lot of small and medium companies won't engage, and we are trying to get them in, especially the tech companies, mm -hmm. in our space because for them to set up the client compliance infrastructure with no revenue yet coming in is just something they can't do. Another one is to minimize the suppliers funding the government, which happens in a couple of places. Pre-funding of materials and labor of a contract you've won during the time it takes to definitize that contract, which could take six months or a year, small and medium companies can't afford to do that. Another one is to maintain a robust level of process, progress payments. It went to 90% under COVID, it may go back to 80, but let me tell you that that flow through of 90% kept a lot of companies in business. And I would recommend maintaining the 90%, but requiring those of us as prime contractors who receive it to flow 100% of that 90% or that incremental 10% to our suppliers. That should be part and parcel of that rule. It isn't today. It should be because we're really trying to protect those small and medium suppliers with that change in, in the ruling. And then expand, as you said, build the, the use of block buys, long-term agreements, because you've got it. We went to our board, frankly, and this is Lockheed Martin. It's the largest aerospace company at the moment by revenue in the world. 
for a $6 billion approval for digital factories. It was going to take eight years to do. And we had to make our case to our board that that was going to get a return on investment. As big a company as ours, we had to get that case. And you know what we got approval for? The first $500 million. We've already almost spent it. But you know, that's the way industry works. You've got to have a viable business case, as Dr. LaPlante is saying, especially if you want to get new entrants. Because if they don't see it, their board or their private equity firm owner is not going to en encourage them or even enable them to get involved. We want them involved, especially in the tech space. Mm. Um, the panelists all seem to agree that the US has a long-term production capacity problem, particularly when compared to China. What steps do we need to take to expand cooperative development and production with US allies and partners and leverage their combined capacities to offset this disadvantage? And how can we do that in a way that sustainably support, supports the health of the U.S. industrial base? It's a big question. Who would like um, to start? I hate, being, I hate having to take it again, but I'll just have to start because um, I'm sort of a bit in the middle of this with the U Ukraine uh, group that the Secretary has pulled together where we have 50 countries around the world huddling on how to help Ukraine. We, my equivalents are now meeting the National Armaments Directors. And what we're talking about and we're trying to figure out is much more co-production, where we have production in each other's countries, yeah. co-development, interchangeability between our different <coughs> systems, uh, and just and a lot more sharing of information. I think the, the, you know, there, there is this recognition that uh, the, the, we all are going to need to do this together in a country. Yes, jobs are important. But, uh, but we're going to have to produce things for each other. We have to be comfortable using equipment developed in another country in our own military and vice versa. We'd love to get your thoughts on this, Secretary Estevez, uh, from the commerce side, yeah. and as we have had this conversation about decoupling. Yeah, a couple of things there. One, you know, and Secretary Armando did a speech earlier this week in which she said, you know, we're not really looking to decouple from China but we we're going to protect the technologies that we must protect for national security, full stop, bottom line. So promote what we can, decouple, protect what we must. Uh, for working with our allies on that, which I, you know, I just got back from Europe myself and a trip planned to, to Asia shortly, they're more than willing now, because of the actions of Putin, because of the temper tantrum that Xi Jinping threw over the straits, in August, when uh, Speaker Pelosi visited, they're more than willing to start talking China with us, which is a good thing. Uh, so they also are looking, how do I diversify my supply chains? How do I get out where I have to get out? And I'm talking to a lot of companies, too, especially the tech companies. And they are looking to, to where they have to go outside of China. Now, it took 40 years to get where we are. It's not going to happen overnight. But there's a wake-up call going on, and I think that's a great thing for us. OK. We are out of time, unfortunately. I think we could have this conversation for the whole rest of the day, but maybe that's just me and I'm partial to the topic. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I just want to say thank you to our esteemed panel, um, Secretary Estevez, Admiral Gilday, Secretary LaPlante, uh, Jim Takelet, and Senator Wicker. Thank you so much, all of you, for being with us and for your insights today. Appreciate it.